I want to talk about the power of standing in, standing on behalf. In this part of the passage in Joshua chapter 3, this is the moment where they cross the Jordan River. We have reached the climactic moment of this movie, if you will, to where they are going to cross the Jordan River. And what's a beautiful picture of this story is what Jesus has done for our life and what we're called to do for others. So what's a stand-in? I was doing some studying and stand-in in movies. There is a person called the stand-in. And actually a lot of professional or high level big name actors and actresses started as stand-ins. So you would, the person would come in, let's just say Brad Pitt, because you know when you think of actor, you think Brad Pitt, I guess. Or maybe that's just me. Anyway, so let's get past that. Brad Pitt does his thing, he acts, but then there's this moment where they need to practice blocking with other people. There will be a stand-in who will come in and just stand and act and do the role in order for him to go and do whatever he needs. To stand in on someone's behalf. So let's take it outside of movies. Somebody calls you at work, they need you to step in on behalf of them because they're sick or something happened with their family and they've got to do. There is power in knowing that there is someone behind you who can step in so that you can do whatever God's calling you to do next. You can take care of your family. You can do whatever. There is a powerful picture when someone will step up and step into a situation so that you can do what God is calling you to do. And we see this picture in Joshua chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to that. If not, we'll have it on one of our multiple screens. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left the Acacia Grove and arrived at the bank of the Jordan River where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelites, uh, the Israelite officers went through the camp giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your position and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before... They will guide you. Stay about a half a mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. So let me clarify what a couple of these things are before we keep going through this passage. The ark of the covenant was, if you've you've seen Indiana Jones, you know exactly what it is. It's, but this is not what we see in scripture. It's opening it up and you you can go watch the movie at your own risk. Uh, But the Ark of the Covenant was the host of the Holy Spirit. It had things like the Ten Commandments and other powerful things that God had used to draw his people closer to him. But it was said that inside of this this big box, there was the Holy Spirit. So they were saying... Because you haven't gone this way yet, Joshua is saying, we're not going to lead, we're not going to pursue a direction that we have never been before, but we are going to follow behind, about a half a mile behind, the Holy Spirit. Because I've learned this, church, the Holy Spirit can take you places that you cannot arrive at on your own. The Spirit of God will lead you places that you've never been before, and it can lead you places that you would not get to otherwise. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail nor abandon you. Sometimes you get to a place in life where you don't know where to go next. Maybe you even know the end game, but you don't know the next step. You're trying maybe to decide what college to go to, what job to pursue, what degree to choose, where your family wants to get your next car. It it doesn't matter. Every little thing. Sometimes we don't know the answers, but can I tell you that there is a navigator and his name is the Holy Spirit. And he will lead you exactly where you need to go every single time. But often what we do is we follow the Holy Spirit. And then when we arrive to our destination that he has led us to, we're like, nah, this ain't it. And we begin to question God. And we always want him to lead us to the next thing until sometimes we see the outcome and we disagree with it. But the Holy Spirit will always lead you to where God wants to take you. The Holy Spirit is like the the greatest compass of all time. This is 
Jack Sparrow's compass. And if you've never watched any of these movies, the compass actually didn't point north. It, I, don't, I don't know how he ended up with this, but it, his compass didn't point north. So everyone else thought it was broken. So he was never going actually the direction that he wanted to go. But he knew that this compass was taking him what, at wherever he desired. So while people are looking at him going in a different direction, they're questioning his navigational system. They're questioning what he's following, but he knows all along that north isn't what's leading him. It's what's inside of him. And can I tell you, church, that when you pursue a life of loving Jesus, when you pursue your purpose in the commission, people are going to question you. They're going to question the decisions you make. They're going to question your motive. They're going to question your navigation system, but when you know that the Spirit of God, the desires of the Father are what's inside of you and those are leading you, you never have to question if you're lost. You see, oftentimes we think that we're lost, but I've learned that it's when you don't know where you are, you trust in God the most. It's when you're the most vulnerable, you're full of the most faith because God has to show up because you have no other direction. I believe that this is a word for you today that the Lord says that your fruit will show what you follow. Do you follow the Holy Spirit? Are your motives, are the decisions that you make fueled by the Holy Spirit? Because the fruit of your life will show what you follow. Scripture says, where your heart is, there your treasures are. Or, yeah. It is the fruit of your life will show you what you follow. If you want to ask yourself the question of, am I following where the Spirit of God is leading me? Look at the fruit of your life. And that if it's fruit that reflects the Father, you will know who you're following. Sometimes it gets hard. <laughs> Why did he say stay half a mile behind? Maybe it's because there was a bunch of kids with him and they knew they were going to keep asking, are we there yet? This is Henley's new thing. Hey, Dad, are we there yet? Are we there yet? This is one of the worst things about Coco Melon is they get these songs stuck in our children's head and they think that we're just going to sing it with them the whole time. <laughs> you know, Dad, you're supposed to sing not yet. So uh, she asked me and we have to sing this song for our 45-minute drive. <laughs> but... Why did they keep them so far back? Maybe it's so they wouldn't ask questions. Maybe it's so they wouldn't have to take control. Maybe it's because they knew that if they would follow behind the Holy Spirit, they would arrive to their destination. If you are lost, you don't know the next step to take. You're battling between two decisions. Can I encourage you to come before the Father and allow him to direct you in what you need to do? Verse 5. Then Joshua told the people, purify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to the priests, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. So they started out and went ahead of the people. Purify yourself, for the Lord will do great wonders among you Tomorrow, Joshua is saying, prepare yourself because tomorrow we step into what God has been waiting to bring into our lives for years. Prepare yourself and set a level of expectation because God's about to do something great. Prepare your hearts and expect God to show up. I've learned the art of preparation and expectations are so important. You heard Pastor Rick talk about it last week, that your expectations will change your experience. When you come to church on Sunday morning, if your expectation is, is all right, we're going to get in and out of this. We're going to do a check mark because this is what I have to do. Your experience will not mirror the person who walked in next to you who said, oh man, I'm so excited to get to church. God's about to move. He's about to heal. He's about to restore. God's about to do something this morning. One of my favorite people to spend uh, church around is Erica Cadet. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure she's been angry before. Perry, I'm not even going to ask you if that's true or not. 
But every time I come into the house, if I'm a little tired, if I'm a little, you know, exhausted or, you know, we're just going through the motions, every time I talk to him, oh, God's about to do something today. And I'm like, you know what? Yes, he is. Like that spirit of expectation is contagious. What spirit do you walk into the house of God with? Are you prepared and expecting God to move in your life? Oftentimes we don't want to prepare or expect something because we don't believe or we don't want to face the wall of conviction. And we know what we did this week. So preparation and expectation for God to move means he's going to come and convict something that I've done this week. Can I tell you, God knows already. God loves you anyways. And he still wants to move in your life. But when we walk around like this, We don't have a spirit of expectation. When we worship like this, I I don't know about you. I didn't play football. I played flag football one time. That was really fun. But if the quarterback throws the ball to the wide receiver and he's standing just like this, what's going to happen? He's probably going to get hit in the teeth. I've seen it before. After I get off the Ravens game and I go to watch the Panthers, I see it all the time. <laughs> Man, shots fired. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, that was too easy. Sports banter, can't do that anymore. But if you're not prepared to receive what God has waiting for you, it's going to hit you in the face or you're going to miss it. We need to be ready. That's why we worship like this. It's not because we want to show off our new deodorant. It's not because we want to act like we're Pentecostal. It's because this is a posture of reception of whatever God sends from heaven. I want to catch it. I want to grab a hold of whatever God is releasing in this room every single time possible. We must have a spirit of expectation. This next part of the passage, I'm going to read it as verse 7 through 16. The Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a step into the river and stop there. So Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord God says. Today you will know the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and the Jebusites ahead of you. You can tell I practiced that. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priests will carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will cut off upstream. And the river will stand up like a wall. So the people left their camp to uh, across the Jordan. And the priests who were carrying the ark of the covenant went behind them. It was the harvest season and the Jordan River was overflowing at its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up at a great distance away to a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed into the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. I'm going to grab a prop real quick, and this is what we're going to practice because this might take me a second. Are you ready? Do, 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 do. Sing it with me. Do, do, do. I, need, I just got to grab something real quick to explain this. It's the art of preparation. All right, so they have to stay prepared. Today we cross the Jordan River. Today we step into all that God has been waiting to give us. And you could tell who showed up prepared and who did it. And I'll tell you what, church, I was going to show up prepared. That was as quick as I could do it. This pastor doesn't put on waiters every single day, but I feel like I look pretty good in this, right? Am I fall pictures, family pictures after this? The art of preparation. And he tells, the pre, he tells everybody to pick one person and the Levitical priests are going to step up and they're going to hold the Ark of the Covenant. 
So imagine that this is the river. Do we have the picture of that by itself? I don't remember if we did that or not. But you've got this river in the background. And everybody is on this side. Everybody needs to get over into the promise that God has waiting for them. And I want to remind you, the Jordan River isn't a creek. I know what we call a river has many different meanings here in North Carolina. It could be this big. It could be hundreds of feet wide. But the Jordan River is about... Uh, 1,300 to or 1,300 to 10,000 feet wide at any given point. At its smallest width, it's 1,300 feet wide, and the depth goes from 50 to 200 feet. So this isn't a stream. This is a ocean in the middle of two pieces of land. And he tells them, "This is what you're going to do." The Levitical priests, this is who I'm imagining I am in this outfit, are going to stand into the water. They're going to walk into the water, into the deep. This is a get in the water and it keeps getting deeper. But what you see is because of their preparation and the power of the Holy Spirit that they cling to, they got in the water, they got down deep. And what happened was the water started to recede and it drained out into the Dead Sea. And because they stood into what God was calling them to, everyone else was able to cross over into the promise. There is power and preparation and you standing in. Are you willing to step into something so someone else can cross over into the land God had promised them? This is what God has been speaking to me all week, and I believe that he wants to me to communicate to you today that some of us haven't really stepped all the way into the water and, and, and doing our devotions and our relationship with Christ and being all in as a part of the church. And because we haven't stepped into the water, the water has yet to recede. But it's when you and I take what the Holy Spirit is directing us to do seriously and we step in, the lost in Harrisburg are able to cross over into the promises and the purpose that God has called them to. The children who are being taught the most ludicrous things in school right now are able to cross over and understand the truth of who God is and who he's called them to be. When you stand in, other people can step into the promise. This is why we serve. This is why we give. This is why we do life groups. Listen, we aren't here to do country club stuff and build numbers of ministries because who cares about that? I'm not going to heaven and turning in how many people we had in our church when I get to eternity, but I will be looking for the people who we tried to reach because I don't want to show up and say there was a whole community of people, but because I didn't serve, I didn't reach them. I don't want to say, God, I, I just wanted to be comfortable with my finances. And because I didn't give, there's children in Africa who had no place to have their babies. This is why we serve. This is why we give. This is why we connect. Because God has called us to grab a hold of the Holy Spirit, to step into who he's called us to be so other people can cross over into eternity. What does it look like for you to step in a little bit deeper? This is why we do party with the pastors every month because we don't want people just to attend and show up. We want you to be a part of a family because that's the way God designed it to be. I promise you, if you sign up to serve, I promise you, if you start tithing, I promise you, if you join a life group and God doesn't do something in your life, I'll give you all your time and money back. Because God will change your life when you live life the way he designed it to be. What I love about this passage is that he clarifies that the water was not at a low receding point when they stepped in. But it says the river was high upon the bank. The circumstances were at their worst for them to be able to cross this river. If you've ever watched any movie or show that has stories of the Oregon Trail, you see that they have to wait for the conditions of the river to get right before they cross over with their horses and carriages and all of these different things. These were the worst conditions possible. Because it's when things look darkest, God does his best work. 
He said, hey, listen, just by the way, I know the water is at an awful place, but this is the time you've crossed. I know you've waited years and years and years, and you could probably wait a couple more days until the water goes back down. But this is when you're going to cross because I want to show this is my power. And the only reason the water receded wasn't just because people put their waders on and they stood in the water. It's because of what they were holding on to. Because they were led by the Holy Spirit. And there was some people who were obedient to serve and to do what the Holy Spirit called them to do. They stood in the river. They held upon the Ark of the Covenant. And verse 17 says, until every single person had gone across. You see, oftentimes we think about the Israelites and we think it's just like a small crew of people. Like it's just, oh, you know, it's probably 200 people that we have here today. This was an entire population. This was a country of people and thousands and thousands of women and children and all of the belongings of what they had left, the generations, the descendants of Moses and their people. They had to stand there and hold on to this Ark of the Covenant until every single person had crossed over. Do we serve? Do we follow the Holy Spirit with that kind of grit of, I know you're tired. I know you've been doing this for years. But there's still one more person who needs to cross over. Come on, I know that you've, you're comfortable where you are and maybe just got connected and don't really know anybody yet. But will you step in so that another person can cross over into eternity? Because when you stand in, people can step into their promise. My favorite story of all time, I tell it all the time, Van, you can come and help me close this out, is Desmond Doss. If you've never seen Hacksaw Ridge, if you can stomach it, do it. It's a, it's a movie uh, about a, a war, and he is a medic. He doesn't grab a gun, but everybody retreats back to camp, and he stays up on the hill, and he's repelling one person down with a rope at a time. And he keeps saying, God, give me one more. His hands are complete just down to flesh and bone because he's repelled so many people down. And every time he runs around and he says, God, just give me one more. They interviewed the Japanese soldiers and they said every time we would get him in our sights, our guns would lock up. They would jam. It's like he was being protected by something. It's because when people are on mission and you're willing to get into the water and step into who God has called you to be, he will protect you. He will give you the strength that you need. He will give you that purpose and you will watch person after person come on 28 people in this past quarter person after person walk over into the promise and the calls that God has placed on their life I don't care how long it takes I don't care how tired I get I will not stop till every person has crossed into the promise we got this picture uh, from my daughter's teacher at first I was like that's so cute but then I remember this is what I stand in for this is why journey this is why we build more classrooms it's so we can see this this is why we don't wait this is why we push forward and we grow and we expand and we reach more people and on October 28th we're going to the parks uh, Harrisburg Park to be a part of their whole trick or treat thing to reach kids we're doing a, um, what's it called, tailgating, tailgating thing for Hickory Ridge football game that same day. We're doing two outreaches for the next generation in the same day. And we need you to stand in. And the reason is so we can, it's not so we can give them a flyer and hope that they become attenders of our church. It's so that we see them doing this. That they are able to cross over into eternity. Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. The heart of someone who serves God is what will bring revival to this nation. People who will love and serve the lost like Jesus did. That's what he did every day. Listen, I, I don't want you to model your life after me. 
at me. Come on. You can do better than that. Model it after Jesus. And what he did is he relentlessly loved people. And he was never too busy to serve. To serve his community, to find the blind person on the side of the road and to heal them, to teach them about what his father was at work doing. And you see, he was our stand-in. This is the beautiful picture. If you look at every passage in scripture, you will see the gospel. But we were on this side of the river from eternity. And the river that separated us was sin. And it flowed too high for us to be able to cross on our own. The father didn't want to leave us here, so he sent his son named Jesus who came and stood in the mess, stood in the storm, bore the death that you and I deserve so that he could stand here and take all the winds and the waves and watch his people cross over into eternity with him. Why do we stand in? Why do we cling to the Holy Spirit? Because that's what Jesus did for us. That's what he did for you. And maybe you're in this house today and you're still standing on this side of the river and you have yet to cross over and be washed by the water and step into the life that he has called you to live in a relationship with him. And if that's you and you haven't made that decision today, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. I'd ask everybody to stand where you are. And you're in this house and you say, you know what, Pastor Wes, I've been doing my own thing. I've been living my own life. I haven't really been pursuing Jesus. I haven't been serving. I haven't been giving. I haven't been doing all the things that God has called me to do. I've been standing on the wrong side of the river, but today I want to accept the sacrifice that Jesus has made to stand in on my behalf so that I can cross over into the promise that God has called me to. If that's you, I'm not gonna butter this up. I'm gonna count to three. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. If you wanna know that you know that you know, if Jesus was to come back right now at the end of this service, that you would be spending eternity with him on three, I want you to raise your hand. This is not to embarrass you. This is not to point you out. Scripture says to boldly proclaim with your mouth that Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that he died on the cross for you. This is the bold declaration that will help you step into the purpose and the reason God created you so that you could inherit an eternal relationship relationship with him. One, two, three. If that's you, Pastor Wes, I don't know where I would end up today. I got you, buddy. I got you right in the middle. Come on. One more second. I want to step into my purpose, the reason I was created. Amen. Come on. Can we give God some praise one time for my buddy that's using Jesus? What I'm going to ask you to do, buddy, Bo, wave your hand back there. Look back in that back corner over there. Raise your hand. That's the man you need to talk to right there and get connected with. He's got all the information that you need, and he's way smarter than me. So I always send people to the smart people. We're so excited. That's what we do it for. That's why we stand in. What we're going to do is we're going to sing this chorus just for about a minute, and I want you to step in, to stand in. I I believe that God is challenging you to make a a, an intentional effort this week, whether it's to get signed up to serve. If you want to find out where you can serve, we've got party with the pastors right after service, 15 minutes, snacks, and we'll help you do that. Whether it's you haven't stepped in and began to tithe, I believe that tithing is a commandment, that it's the obedience that God calls us to. I'm not a big, you know, whatever, you pick your number on 10%. I believe that God calls you to give you first fruits of everything and to give with a cheerful heart. That is something that will release financial provision in your life that you have never seen before. If you would, if you could go to Las Vegas and you knew there was one slot machine that would bring something uh, fruitful to your life every single time, you'd probably go to that one every time, right? And then come back to church so that we can pray for you. That we, I'm just kidding. That's what the kingdom of God is. It is a return that never comes forward. Maybe it's to serve, maybe it's to begin to give, maybe it's to be a part of a life group, maybe it's to step in and be a part of the journey. We're so excited to say that construction is gonna start like within the next week for phase one, praise God. Uh, But yeah, amen, we can praise him for that, that's good, not a trick. 
but there's still a phase two and we're believing for God to provide and to show up. And it's when the people of God will grab a hold of the Holy Spirit and stand in the middle of the river, we will begin to see the lost flood across this dry river, a clean place for them to walk across so that they can step into eternity with him. Heavenly Father, I pray for this next minute as we begin to respond with worship.